Hi everyone, my name is Makoto. I work at a company called Hopper. Uh, I lead the user acquisition team there as well as a couple of our product growth teams as well. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about uh, how we're building a super app for travel and uh, what the last couple of years have been like for us and hopefully uh, there'll be some helpful lessons for all of you as well. So for those of you who don't know Hopper, uh, we help customers spend less and travel better. We do this primarily via an app, but also have a website and we work also via B2B partnerships with partners like Capital One. And overall, our core aspiration is to be the best place to book travel, hands down. So kind of wanted to start with this graph. Any guesses as to what this chart represents? So this unfortunately is our sales when COVID first hit. Uh, some of you might remember that we had a global pandemic back in the day, and this was super impactful on, on travel, obviously. As a travel app, it's pretty tough when your core product essentially became illegal for a couple months there. Uh, but this also kind of created a challenge that allowed us to grow into what we are today and gave us the opportunity to learn a lot of lessons that are really fundamental to our growth now, and that's kind of what I'll be talking about today. So we kind of had two core challenges, one of which is if we wanted to survive, we need to grow revenue before travel demand recovered. And we couldn't wait and we didn't know how long this would take. This was back in the day when like toilet paper was selling out and no one knew how long this would take. Uh, so we knew we we're gonna have to find a way to grow revenue before travel comes back. But we didn't want to do this by increasing prices or adding fees because we wanted to maintain the fact that Hopper's gonna stay the best place to book travel, and we can't do that if we start doing things like hidden fees. We also needed to grow our user base because a lot of people had deleted travel apps, they stopped installing travel apps. We needed to do so without getting into a head-on battle with our very powerful competitors like Expedia and Booking.com uh, that have budgets that are literally in the billions. Booking.com spends about $6 billion a year on marketing. So the first thing we really focused on is accelerating our product development to add new ways to monetize users. And the way that we did that is that we completely reorged the whole company. Under the model of Amazon, this thing called single-threaded ownership, rather than having a product team, a design team, an engineering team like we used to, we started to build these small, cross-functional, 12-person or less teams that instead of working backwards from a function like design, we're working backwards from a customer outcome or a business outcome. So instead of having a design team, we started building teams like the hotel pricing team. And all they were focused on is making sure that we had the best possible prices on hotels, for example. And each of these teams as a leader is fully accountable for that team. And everything required to hit that objective, whether it's product or data, uh, engineering, design, all of that integrated into one team. And this led to a really cool combination of both accountability and autonomy for these teams because they can operate completely independently of each other. This had a huge impact on our product cadence, where we went from being able to ship two or three major products a year to suddenly being able to ship one every month. And this is without like any significant increases in headcount either. We weren't really hiring active. We actually had a hiring freeze in 2020. We started to launch some really impactful products that set the stage for the next couple of years of growth. Uh, and essentially, now that we had independent teams working on all of these things, smart people were focused all day, every day on, on, on building these things and eventually would figure them out. One of the things that led to is that our travel bookings started to diversify a lot. So Hopper is still known as a flights app. Today, it's actually less than 50% of our bookings are flights. Hotels and cars are growing quickly enough that they're starting to outpace the growth on the flight side of things. And this really started right after the pandemic. And this was especially important because flights were the most affected and the slowest to recover, whereas hotels and car rentals, people started taking staycations uh, a lot more quickly. This gave us a lot of good revenue growth. The other thing that happened is that one of the core products that we had was price prediction, where we could predict future flight prices, 95% accuracy, and that was a core value prop we had for a while. And what some of our product teams started to think about is what are some new ways we could monetize that ability? One of which was price freeze, where we can essentially price the risk of a, of a flight going up or down in price over the next week. So we can create a product called price freeze, 
where you as a user can pay a fee to lock in a flight or hotel price if you want that price but you're not quite ready to book. And we've been the only ones that have been able to do this because we can predict future flight prices well enough that we can accurately price the risk of doing this. We can also price the risk of you canceling your flight or you're wanting to change your dates to offer great flexibility options and great disruption protection as well, where, for example, if your flight gets delayed, we'll give you a credit. If, you're, if you miss a connection, you get an extra credit as well. All of these things essentially are ways for you to save money, even if your plans change, based on the core data advantage that we had over our competitors. And these fintech products, this whole suite, actually now represents over 50% of our revenue. And all of that was fully incremental, mostly developed during COVID. And this was especially impactful during COVID because it was a time when people's travel plans were very uncertain. So these things really resonated with users and are still resonating now. So with all these new products and these new value propositions that users started to really like, it's also accelerated our already pretty good cohort retention. So we actually switched over to then having positive net revenue retention year over year. So our pre-2022 cohorts are generating more revenue this year than they have in any of their previous years. And this unlocked a lot for us. So essentially, we were able to really widen the pool of monetization in the app by adding all of these new products, all fundamentally off this reorg that allowed us to do just more things at once with the same resources that we already had. And it also kind of unlocked the second point here. Where once we had all this extra LTV, all this extra retention, all this monetization, we're able to leverage that new revenue and these new value propositions to really aggressively grow our install base as well. And it essentially unlocked paid social at a really high scale for us. And the reason paid social is so important that every other travel company grows almost exclusively via Google search. So it's super competitive, really hard for a new entrant to come in. Paid social is not a channel they're really able to leverage because if you think of a, a travel booking, it's not something you do impulsively, right? You wouldn't see a Facebook ad for a flight and then book a flight the same day. But Hopper, because of our retention, we can acquire low intent users. People are starting to think about a trip, not quite ready to book, but there's all these things like price prediction, price freeze, and generally the app is built for the full funnel so we can acquire low intent users on paid social, retain them until they are ready to book, and then give them really good value propositions once they're ready. So we have an entirely paid social heavy mix, paid social or direct, which allowed us to essentially go around the competition. And this allowed us to really significantly grow our install base. So we went from getting a few hundred K at most installs per month to over 2.5 million installs per month driven for one by strong growth and organic from all these, uh, all the word of mouth on these new products, but also from like a really aggressive increase in marketing budgets where we went from spending a couple hundred K per month to now spending over a hundred million dollars a year uh, on performance marketing. This allowed us to hit number one in travel last year, uh, despite us having much smaller marketing budgets than all the competitors that were there with us. And all that combined, we actually ended up doubling our revenue in 2020 uh, because we were able to recover very quickly. And then 2021 was even larger than that, about 4x, uh, along with the growth of our cloud product as well. So then I was showing this slide to the CEO at the end of uh, 2021 and the whole number one installs thing. And he had a really great question, actually, which is like, well, if you're number one, what are you going to do now? How are you going to keep growing if you're already hitting number one? And when we looked at our install counts, compared to some of our e-commerce peers as well, it was actually interesting to see that our Q4 installs annualized was about 25 million. That would put us pretty high up there. And what we realized is, you know, realistically, we're probably not going to get more installs than Amazon. So there's not really that much more room for growth left on just adding more installs, especially with performance marketing. You know, your incremental CAC gets so high over time that we started to realize we're going to have to find something else to grow. And that's when we started looking outside of travel. And what we realized is there's, outside of North America, this problem's been solved by super apps. And this is where we started to get really interested in these apps, like Pinduoduo is the, this, this first one, Kupang is the number one app in Korea. These apps have been able to grow much more quickly than their peers in the West. And they've been able to do so with very little marketing budget through product-led growth. So this first one, 
Pinduoduo, classic uh, social commerce company, they reached $5 billion of revenue in five years. Fastest company to ever do that. Also the fastest company to ever reach a $100 billion market cap. Almost all of their marketing budget is spent through the app. And we started to look at these peers and start to realize like they're, they're showing us the path to unbounded growth, basically. So that's our, our, our new goal now is we're becoming a super app for travel where we're taking all of these new value propositions that we've made and we're learning from the largest apps in Asia, the largest apps in Latin America, and using their path to grow here in North America. So there's a few kind of core growth principles that we're following with the Super App Initiative. One of which is they use targeted discounts to incentivize conversion and retention. So if you think of discounts as just marketing spend, at a certain point we start to realize, would we want to spend our 11th million dollars on Facebook ads? Or would the incremental CAC be lower if we just gave away a million dollars to our users every month? Like what kind of word of mouth impact would that have? What kind of conversion and retention impact would that have? And what these apps have been able to do is they do this at billion dollar scale and they always tie all their engagement and retention mechanisms back to actual purchasing in their marketplace by always rewarding users with discounts for that marketplace. So they always end up buying. The other thing is they have social first features that go way beyond like the classic referral program that we have here. And they think about referral much more on the session level than on the install level. So if you think of a classic referral program, give 10, get 10, you try to get your installs to get you another install. They're thinking about it on a session level where every time someone opens an app, how can we get them to get their friend to also open the app? Every single app open, uh, which has obvious impacts on their MAU. The other thing is that they have constant novelty. There's always new things going on, which creates really high launch frequency. And launch frequency in itself has no value, but what it allows them to do is it gives them a lot of opportunity to merchandise what they're trying to merchandise and gives them a lot of time to talk to their users, which is very valuable for us too. And the last thing is that they have discovery-driven merchandising. You don't actually need to search to find a product. They're surfaced to you, and this is super important because it allows them to merchandise a long tail of products without having to wait for users to search for them. This one's especially interesting to us because we took an app that was originally built for flights and then added hotels, cars. We have homes now, each of which have four or five fintech products. We have all these new growth features as well. And we've been having trouble merchandising all of that, but these super apps have solved that at a much wider scale. So one of the first things we launch is the super apps are really good at big sales events. And these sales events uh, uh, at full scale are really crazy, like full nationalized tele TV events and everything. We've started to run these in-app super sales events where users get all kinds of discounts on, on travel, on fintech, play mini games to get extra discounts, raffles. Uh, these create increases in launches and sales of over 100% on the days that we launch them and retention that's comparable to our, all of our other users. And so far, the CAC on these sales is about 40% cheaper than what we can get on paid social, uh, all through basically these like large in-app sales events. They're also our biggest source of referrals currently. The other thing we launched is that uh, we wanted to introduce these products that were lower priced so that you don't need to make your first purchase of a couple hundred dollars uh, to enter into the Hopper marketplace, essentially. And what these super apps do well, and I'm sure all of you who work in gaming know super well, is loot boxes. And so we started selling these loot boxes as we saw on, on our Cinco de Mayo sale, which was a pinata that you could open. We sell thousands and thousands of these on the days that we, that we try to sell them. And it's essentially a great way for you to put down $5 to get a reward, but now you've added your payment information, you've created an account, and you're you have a credit now that you want to use. And this has been a really effective conversion mechanism for us to convert new users that are a little bit skeptical and might not be ready to make a multi-hundred dollar purchase, but will make a $5 purchase. On the frequency side of things, they have like very basic streak mechanisms where if you log in every day, you get a certain discount. And Pindolodo actually took it to a whole different level where they have a Farmville-like game where you have to grow a tree by locking in every day. And if you water the tree every day, it 
spreads fruits. And when I say fruit, I mean actual fruit that they'll ship, like they'll send you lychees to your door uh, or discounts in, in our case. So we're building uh, similar mechanisms as well to increase frequency. This Pindle Door game, by the way, has 40 million daily active users. For those of you who are still skeptical. And the last thing that we started building is that Hopper is just better with friends. You know, we think of it as like there's a single player version of Hopper that we've been building over all these years. Now we're building the multiplayer version where if you want to book with your friends, there's team buy. You both get a discount for booking together. If you want to watch flights, search flights with your friends, it's just better. If you participate in a sale together, you get extra discounts. Basically, everything is better when you use Hopper with friends to add a full organic uh, virality loop to the marketplace that we've built as well. This is directly tied to Pindle, though their biggest growth lever was team buy. So all that's come together along with the FinTech and travel improvements that we've been making. That growth continued basically, and now we're pacing a 30X over 2019. So COVID's fully in the rear view mirror. Uh, we're pacing to at least quadruple this year. We have a lot of things that haven't even kicked in yet. So the main takeaways that we got is one of the most impactful things is that we organized our teams in a way that maximized autonomy and accountability. And those two concepts are super important in our culture. Teams that should be able to do anything they need to do to make their results happen, but are also fully accountable for those results. The other thing is that we stopped thinking so much about user acquisition and you know, ad buying and everything is important and creative is the other big lever. But at the end of the day, the biggest lever on user acquisition is just build a better product for your customers. And then everything else just kind of started to fall in place for us. And then the last thing is we start to look outside of our own industry for growth ideas because travel is a certain thing. But once we start to think about like, who are the leaders in mobile? You know, what can we learn from mobile gaming? What can we learn from super apps in Asia? These guys are much bigger than us. What would be the equivalent of a loot box for Hopper? Then we started to unlock a whole different stage of growth that took us past the local maxima of what we were getting from growth ideas and travel. So yeah, overall that was our path and hopefully uh, some interesting insights for you guys to take away as well. <laughs>